Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's RLW Read, Listen, Watch from Roofer's Coffee Shop. My name is Karen Edwards, and I'm really excited for today's RLW because it's all about the Architectural Fuse color forecast brought to you by Sherwin Williams. And before we dive in, um, just a few housekeeping reminders that this is being recorded. It will be on demand, um, typically within 24 hours on our website. So feel free to um, share it um, if there's someone that you feel really should see this because it's going to be awesome. Um, also, I want to uh, let everyone know that the chat is open. Um, everyone can talk to each other, talk to us, um, drop a line, let us know where you're from. We'd love to hear from you. And if you have questions throughout, go ahead and drop them in the chat and we'll take a few minutes at the end and um, answer your questions. So let's get started. I would like to welcome, let's advance my slide, um, our guests, Kiki Redhead and Bryn Wildenauer. Welcome. Hi, Karen. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah, we're so excited to have you guys here for this architectural fuse color forecast. So let's learn a little bit more about our presenters. Kiki, tell us about yourself and your background. Yeah, so I have um, over 20 years of experience in color design and development, um, long history across um, companies that specialize in coatings, pigments, effects, finishes. Um, I have a master's degree in trend forecasting and um, and I just am very, very passionate about color and design and um, really enjoy uh, getting to spearhead the design house in Minneapolis, uh, which is located at our industrial and coil headquarters and um, have the wonderful opportunity to work with Bryn and have her on the team as well. Bryn, tell us about your background and yourself. Yeah, so I have a degree in industrial design and have been working in product design and development for seven, eight years now. So um, I have uh, quite a bit of experience in color and color layering and um, just being associated with trends and uh, figuring out the best solutions for customers and internal marketing uses. Excellent. Thank you. Well, let's jump right in. Tell us. What is the Architectural Fuse color forecast? So this is a tool um, that we've created uh, to have a conversation with our customers about where colors have been, uh, where colors are now, and where color is going to be going for the future. Um, and it is um, an, an entire kind of uh, analysis of the market and in looking at different segments. Uh, within the uh, metal um, coil and extrusion architectural marketplace. And the FUSE forecast outlines um, kind of one big mega trend that we're seeing and distills that down into th three trends at like the macro level. So what, what you'll see um, happening in um, materials and manufacturing and technology and how that will distill into color. And then we have the opportunity to have that conversation all around color. Excellent. And what's the history behind this? I mean, how long have you been doing this? So, uh, so we uh, started the design house initiative five years ago. In fact, we are going to be celebrating our five-year anniversary. So we're really excited about that. Um, and we started immediately focusing on the foundation of really every color tool that comes out of Sherwin, every custom color collection for our OEM customers, um, you know, every specified color out there with the contractors and the architects and the designers um, comes from the, this foundational piece. So we've, we've been doing this now um, for five years through the design house. Wow, that's excellent. And um, why? Why does it matter, I guess, is, is the question. <laughs> well, when we look at like a, a strategy for the building products industry, a lot of our customers really want to have a competitive advantage. They also want not only to have competitive advantage over their competitors, but they also want to be able to offer uh, the latest and greatest finishes and colors and coatings technologies, performance and durability attributes and application processes, um, in out, in, both 
in the manufacturing facilities so for those factory applied coatings or out in um, out on site. So this is really important, not only for us to be able to provide uh, this forward future thinking information, but we find that it is very important and it's very valued by our, our customers. Okay, so Bryn, you're the one that takes this forecast and you, you how do you use it with the customers? Yeah, so it really, we break it down um, and we have examples throughout the forecast of all of the different industries that our customers serve. So we really break it down into how do certain colors add value to customers in their region, in their demographic, if they're building barns versus sky rises, those are different different animals. So we wanted to represent everything within the forecast, but it can all be translated into what would work best for each customer. So what we do is focus on what the customer's needs are and how they could use the information for the forecast within their own product lines um, and help them develop the new coatings if they're needed to, you, you know, if the development is needed there. But uh, we, we focus on kind of educating on what the forecast is, why we're doing it, and then how to apply it to their specific industries. Okay, so let's take a look at the overview um, and, and what influences and, and, you know, how we put all this together, because, I, you know, I thought maybe somebody just says, I like that color. Let's, let's create that one, but so much more goes into it. So let's talk a little bit about um, the influences behind that. So in trend forecasting, there's like three different levels of trends. Um, and they're influenced or driven by different societal factors. So at the mega trend level, you know, these are these are really big global trends that are essentially affecting like all of humanity and our planet. These are major cultural shifts. These are things like you know global pandemics. These are things like uh, sustainability initiatives and climate. These are things like um, diversity and inclusion, right? Really, really big trends that most likely for most of us are probably not even going to be solved in our lifetime. Uh, they're, they're constant and, and they will continue to be big global trends going forward for many decades. When you get down to the macro level, which is kind of where we start to focus um, in our forecast, we divide it out with kind of like three themes or like three trend stories. Um, and those are more at the manageable macro level. We're talking like maybe like five to 10 years. Um, those are important because when we look at what the consumer's purchasing behavior is or the end user of our product, uh, when we look at technology and how technology is changing, and we, when we look at product design, um, when we look at trends in architecture, um, th those influences and the, the innovators and the early adopters and the, um, the inspirational uh, influencers from those different categories um, drive a lot of kind of the next wave of design trends, right? So there's all sorts of societal elements the economy plays a big role, politics, regional, um, regional cultural aspects play a big politics or uh, play a big uh, part of what then distills down to the micro level. And at the micro level, that's where we start talking about aesthetics, where we start talking about form and function and color and texture. Um, and, and that's where those come into play. So everything kind of drives down um, and distills all the way until you get to color trends. It's fascinating. And we're going to dive deeper into that a little bit and with some real world examples um, that'll help you, you know, wrap your, your mind around um, how much influences colors and the trends. And tell, talk a little bit about the data. You guys are, are, have been around for a long, long time. So you have a lot of data that goes behind this too, right? We do. I mean, Sherwin Williams, well, you know, over a 155 year old company, Valspar, over a 200 year old company. Um, we have a lot of data on what colors sell, um, you know, how they sold in the past, how they're selling now, 
that allows us to figure out how we can predict which colors are going to be popular sellers in the future. Um, and, and we can watch those evolutions and those shifts um, of, you know, when we think back to a specific decade, think back to the 1960s, think back to the 80s, think back to the 2000s, you can probably immediately think of specific colors from those eras, right? Avocado or refrigerators, for example, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, brown cedar exterior residential homes, right? So there's, there's these specific kind of cyclical trends. We take that data, um, we use data to support every color prediction that we're making. We don't sit in a, in a vacuum with a dartboard on the wall and with, you know, color swatches all over and just, you know, oh, this is going to be the popular color. This is going to, that's not how it works. We want to make sure that we're validating all of our predictions with the, with the, with not only the sales data, um, but also data on information of even just what color swatches what panels our customers are ordering. So what color spaces are they interested in? Maybe they didn't end up specifying that color space, but they ordered 10 samples of the of this red color space. So what are, you know, what was their thought process and inspiration there? Um, so um, I'll let um, Bryn add anything about the data that she's thinking about. Yeah, we have a lot of internal resources that we utilize um, as far as real world data, but we also have a lot of external resources and we track, you know, where our customers are selling the most uh, paint or, you know, product, but also, you know, what's happening outside of that. So we've got a lot of different um, contributing factors that go into our real world, real world data that we all compile and come together and uh, make educated decisions for the forecast. Excellent. Um, and now I uh, want to learn what the six step process is. What's involved in that? So our six step process is a, actually a trademarked process that I created when I owned my own global color trend agency when I was out on my own for 10 years in between corporate gig and corporate gig. Well, Sherwin <laughs> Williams and now Sherwin Williams again. So, <laughs> um, but the six step process is is essentially the pillars that we use to put together our forecast every year. And um, it starts off with trend management because trend information is coming at us at, you know, lightning speeds and it's coming from all angles. Um, and it's coming from, well, all of those areas of societal influences that we talked about earlier. So trend and being able to manage all these trends. So we start off with just trend management, gather, gather, gather information. We might be getting something from the Department of National Intelligence on the 10 mega trends for the next 10 years for the United States. We might be getting information from the Color Marketing Group, which is the kind of professional organization that all of us um, kind of expert color designers are members of, and we all collaborate and we take that information. So managing all that. Then we start to hone in um, and we start to focus specifically on the identification. So identifying specifically what trends are going to be important in the coatings industry, in the architectural industry, um, and, you know, for some of our other segments that we do forecasting for, we might be talking about medical devices or something that day. So we identify the trends that are going to be important or that currently are important in those areas, and then we build our research around those um, specific trends. The, the third step then is the data and the analysis. So we've managed the trends, we've identified the important trends for this particular market. We've done our research around them and now we're supporting our research with the data. After that, we then um, start a process, a very long process, a year over year and never ending process of, of trend watching and trend watching a little bit different than what I'm going to talk about for our next step, but trend watching is essentially tracking trends month over month, year over year, and continuing to watch and be aware of when shift or change is going to happen. Of course, things come in that you don't expect. 
Um, we talked about one of them earlier, um, a, a global pandemic, right. um, you know, a, a housing market crash like in 2008. Um, so that that can then all of a sudden like completely do a 180 on maybe a trend you've been watching for tracking for five or six years. And all of a sudden it just like skids off the side of the road, <laughs> and, you know, makes an immediate left and you're like, whoa, what happened there? So that tracking element is really important, but trend spotting is also equally as important because that's the boots on the ground work. That's getting out there and talking to the contractors. That's getting out there and talking to the architects, talking to our OEMs, going to the trade shows, going to the conferences for, you know, AIA or who, whatever group is putting this together, but being involved in those activities and listening to the conversations so that we can start to spot um, with our antenna up uh, when new trends are starting to come into the market, that we can be ahead of those so that we can help have that conversation through these forecasts with our customers. And then the very last step of the process is the actual reporting. It's the actual report. Um, and, and that's, I know we're going to get to talk about a couple of the highlights from that report here in a few minutes, um, taking that report and then partnering with our customers to help them apply those trends to their products, to apply those colors to their products. And that's the very last step. Okay. So Bryn, you are the one that, you know, works with the architects and the product manufacturers. What, how do you see this report inspire them? How do you see, um, you know, their, their ideas change? Yeah. So a big part of what we like to work on is, you know, we put this report together. It's, it's very in-depth, but kind of helping them translate it. So like I said earlier, we've got a lot of industries that we cover within that but all of those industries and colors can kind of weave back and forth. So our goal is to inspire and encourage people to think differently about the options because most of you know, our product manufacturers have had the same color palette for 20, 30, 40 years. So how can we encourage them to understand that you know, building product trends do change? And just because people are specifying one color on their color card doesn't mean that's the color that they really want. So how can we help and partner with our customers on finding that right white that would work in their market or, you know, how we can add a texture or a mica to a product that came out of the trend forecast that could potentially increase their sales or, you know, make their own kind of individualized mark on their products and projects. Excellent. Okay, so we're going to move on to talk about the importance of these trend life cycles. And you've touched on it a little bit, Kiki, but um, I think here we're gonna spend a little bit of time uh, going deeper um, and maybe sharing some examples. Yeah, this is the part of trend that is so fascinating, fascinating to me. I just absolutely love this. And hopefully some of my passion will come through to all of our listeners. Um, the, the cyclicality of trends is extremely important in the marketplace. We also want to make sure that our trend life cycles and our color trend life cycles are pairing up with the product life cycle. We don't want to put a two year color trend on a product that has uh, a lifespan in the market of 30 years, right? Because now you're stuck with this color and if it goes out of vogue really fast, you know, you're, you've put all of this um, money into, let's say a metal roof, for example, and now you've got a color that's outdated in two or three years. So we are very cautious to that. And we are very cognizant that when we are putting together these types of reports, that we're paying very, very close attention to the product life cycles, that they match up with the macro trend life cycles. So those societal influences, what's happening in sustainability, what's happening in the economy, you know, how is it going to affect people um, as they interact or they use this product? Um, and then pairing that up with the longevity of the product and how long the product will be in the marketplace. So I love to use this little graph here. Um, I know it just looks like a whole bunch of lines right now, and I'll explain a little bit uh, what each of these means. 
the, the, the kind of teal blue, that line that goes up really fast and down really fast, those are those fad, short-lived trend type colors. We don't work with those in factory applied coatings. You can get away with those types of, of fads, things like throw pillows on the couch in the living room, um, maybe a bathroom rug. Um, these are those really quick, easy things that you can kind of like swap out whenever you want to. Um, in consumer goods, you might, you know, the fidget spinner was a fad. Um, jelly shoes was a fad. Uh, pet rock was a fad. So we don't, we stay away from those. <laughs> um, where we like to focus in more is on these life cycles and these colors that are going to be in the market for longer. So the, the navy blue line is, is very, very product specific. So that's not even just an industry in general, it's a one specific product type within an industry. So this could be, you know, metal roofing colors versus asphalt shingle roofing colors, right? It's very, very, very industry specific. You can see that a typical life cycle is about seven years for a product driven trend. Um, and that that color will plateau in the market for about three to four years, not super long. Um, so we take that further. And what we like to do is focus on color trends that are more industry driven, right? So now you could find this color trend in roofing materials, but you could also find it in gutters and fascia and garage doors and hardware and fencing materials. So if you're talking residential design and um, exteriors, now you're seeing this color trend in adjacent products. And you can start to create these color schemes where these colors all go together and match really well and create a very harmonious exterior scheme. That's that magenta line. That is like the most important line for color trends for an industry. You can see 10 years and it's still, you know, tracking on the, on the, um, a slightly on the downside, but still tracking with really good um, accept acceptability in the marketplace. So you've got at least 10 years there, um, maybe even more where that color is gonna be strong in the, in the market. The lime green line, that's everybody's dream line. That's 70% that's plus um, acceptability in the marketplace for this trend, this color. This is where color trends start to penetrate cross industry. So now we're not just talking about the building products industry or the construction industry. Now we're talking about the automotive industry or we're talking about the graphic design industry, or we're talking, you know, so it goes so much further beyond that. Maybe it goes into workplace trends or medical device trends or, but now it's like something that you just see everywhere. Uh, and you're like, oh, I saw that silver in that car yesterday. And now I'm seeing it in this appliance over here. And now I'm seeing it on this monumental building and this curtain wall over here. So that Lime line doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it's memorable and you'll remember it for a very long time. And that trend will be 10, 15, 20 years long. And we love to use the example of silver and gray um, because that story started off in 2006. And let me just preface this with we are just starting to fade out of grays and back into like the warmer colors where there's like an influence of warmth into the gray. So we're just starting to see the shift away from cool grays, but it started in 2006. That is a really long life cycle for a color trend. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's that lime green going on right there. <laughs> it is. So it started off with upper middle class and upper class 
homeowners. All in that time, the housing market was fantastic. People were building these giant McMansions, as we like call, to call them. And a lot of these homeowners wanted to have the best of the best. And they were looking at their kitchen designs. How can I one up my neighbors on my kitchen? Hmm. Restaurant quality appliances in my kitchen. I want a 12 burner, you know, range with a griddle in the middle, you know, very high end. Well, restaurant appliances are all stainless steel. So now you've got residential homeowners bringing commercial restaurant grade appliances into their home. This started to get noticed by the appliance industry. In 2008, we all know what happened to the housing market. A lot of middle class, uh, middle lower class members, a lot of job layoffs, a lot of people um, being underwater on their mortgage, on their house. It was a very, very rough time for a lot of people. And people were realizing, oh my gosh, if I don't sell my house right now, I'm going to be in a bad financial situation. What can I do? What's an easy fix that I can do to interior my home to make it more saleable and make it more enticing? The appliance companies at the same time over that last two years, they had time to start developing stainless steel look and stainless steel appliances in the, in the traditional lower end kitchen appliances your more middle of the road type brands and products. So now it was opened up to the masses. So now that's that lime green line is on the way up, 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 right? And then in around 2010, as from 2010 to 2012, as people started to kind of slowly, we started to slowly dig ourselves out of um, those, the housing situation, the financial situations, we, we saw a lot of people were looking for uh, that clean slate, that, that fresh start. Um, they were also looking for a bit of wisdom and they wanted things in their life to feel concrete and solid and stable. Well, gray is the color of white and black mixed together. You literally can't get more stable than like concrete gray, right? <laughs> so that started to influence into um, design and decor. And that gray went really, really nicely with that cool silver that was being incorporated into everyone's kitchens. And then silver branched out and it went into the car market. And the car market, what happened was, is luxury in the car market had always been identified by pearly whites. And now because of this luxury appliance look people were having in their homes, they're like, well, luxury automobiles should also be silver. And so then we started to see that crossover translation into other markets. And we are still riding the coattails of the silver trend today. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's incredible how it started with one thing and it just oozed over into everywhere because my old white refrigerator is now my basement refrigerator you know because yeah. <laughs> I needed to upgrade uh, for that stainless look when that was really popular um, but yeah that's just fascinating wow and amazing so let's um, talk about some of these bullet points uh, that that influence the color I mean that was a great example with with the with the societal um, but even economy uh, we talked a little bit about um, that in our practice earlier, um, where, you know, the the economy, I think it was a good example you gave of the, you know, making it more affordable, but taking that color. And, and this is done because manufacturers are studying these trends, just like you guys are doing, right? Yeah. And wow. I think I think a big uh, resource that we have at the design house is we can do the research and help the customers implement it. So it's a, a really nice way for people to utilize all of that information and not have to distill it themselves because it's it's quite overwhelming to research all the societal influences and everything that goes into how color evolves um, and specifically in the building products industry that takes a lot of time. So um, it's, it's a nice resource that we have this FUSE forecast that can help kind of visualize 
what's happening and where we're going next in the building product market. Yeah, that, customers, that is great. It would be very hard for someone to do that on their own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And our customers, you know, they're, they're looking for ways that they can make their processes more efficient. Um, you know, and, and a lot of times, um, they, they want to take a look at you know, when the economy is good, you know, should we have more colors available or um, should we try to simplify um, our color collections? Can you help us curate that? Um, and understanding that you know, during different types of economic um, stabilities or instabilities, you know, things like global supply chain, um, you know, making sure um, that, you know, we're able to supply our customers with the products and colors that they're looking for us, so that they can, they can supply their customers with the colors and products that they're looking for. So, um, you know, the economy plays a really big role in that availability. Um, sure. And, and, and then another major influence is culture and humanity, uh, because a lot of, colors have different meanings across different cultures. Um, you know, one of my favorite examples is, um, you know, in here in North America and in, in the United States, um, our culture wears white wedding dresses. Um, but in, in, in India, they wear red for wedding dresses. And, and here in North America, that white wedding, wedding dress in Africa, white is worn to funerals. So it's just understanding cultural um, identifiers and the psychology of color. We don't expect our customers to have that expertise. That's, that's what we're here for is to help them through those discussions. You know, is this white a good white for my product? I sell on the East Coast of the, of North, of the United States we would talk about those regional needs and we talk about what whites are going to be key for them and perfect perfect it was so right yeah, to the yeah, regional we, like, like we practiced that or something that, yeah. that worked out perfectly yeah so let, let's talk a little bit about that because where you are in north america or in the united states that's going to play a role in colors that are are trending right absolutely and there's a there's a lot of different factors that we take into consideration when we do work on regional color trends. Um, and sometimes it's it's a you know nationwide color palette, but we have to make sure that we're focusing on each region specifically to make sure we're getting all the bases of uh, the manufacturer's needs. But there's a lot of environmental um, considerations to have into account with, uh, you know, do we want lake colors? Do we want, you know, desert colors? How, how do we want the feeling uh, to kind of incorporate or you know be a contrast to the landscape um, what are people interested in from a residential side it's very interesting because like in texas a uh, very huge trend is black metal roofs well is that what everybody wants or is that just a trend that might you know it fade out eventually so looking at all of those considerations as far as regional and then you know it is the culture in texas to have a black metal roof again that's not the same in where we are in minnesota so um how do we kind of balance all of that out and make sure that we're we're looking at those regional details and then we also consider um the weather into effect because the weather impacts which technologies and which resin systems that we're um, helping our customers specify uh because the canada market it's a little bit different than south florida so how do we kind of work through that and which colors are more appropriate um, within those resin systems as well so where would those black roofs in texas fall on the bell curve <laughs> It's a it's a very individualized. I mean, we are seeing black roofs in in other markets as well, not as strong as we are seeing down in the the, the Texas area. Um, but it would be um, that navy blue because it's very honed in specifically on one color on one product like metal roofing, right? So you know you're going to see a, a good five to seven year cycle with it. Um, but we are actually starting to see other regions that where, where the black is too contrast for them, um, where it's too dark. And so we're seeing more regional collections stepping a little bit back from black 
and in incorporating um, off blacks or maybe like a dark charcoal gray or a really dark bronze. It's almost no. black, but not, not black. Yeah, I'll also add here that we take into account the adjacent products. So when we're talking about residential roofing, we're also looking at the trends in gutters and windows and fencing and all of those different things and how they can all work together. So when we're analyzing these trends, that is like top of mind 100% of the time because we need to make sure that they all can work together in like a harmonious way. Okay, so now we're going to get to the juicy part, although I think all this information up till now has been super interesting and we hope you're all learning a lot about colors. Um, the report itself, it, it does have three themes. So maybe just um, what each theme is, and then we, we will take a deeper look into each theme uh, um, as we work our way toward the end of the webinar. Yeah. So our first theme is, um, we call it ACT. It's Accountability-Centered Technology. So we know that technology is moving at, you know, lightning speeds. Um, in the past five years, we've had more technological advancement than we had from um, 1900 to the year 2000. So in five years, more advancement than the previous decade of 100, or the previous uh, century of century. 100 years. Um, so that boom has uh, you know, brought technology to the center of a lot of the things that we do. Obviously the different technologies like our coil technology versus our extrusion technology versus our ability to do um, you know, prints and patterns on, um, on coil substrate or on uh, aluminum substrates in our coil process with like rotogravure printing, um, you know, what's next? digital printing technologies, right? So kind of taking a look at how technology is going to um, uh, is, is going to marry with color and finish and effects for the future. So that was story one. Um, story two, um, for all of the, the contractors and on the call, we'll love this one because this one is all about building. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is about building futures um, that are going to help our communities um, to thrive. Um, it's about building infrastructures, you know, everything from, from um, building um, actual buildings to building roads, to building housing, to building, you know, relationships, um, business relationships and personal relationships. It's also about the infrastructure of getting internet out to like rural areas. Um, you know, so if there was ever a need, let's hope not ever a need for a stay at home again that, you know, kids out, you know, 100 miles away from the, the you know, a local community could be able to attend school through through the Internet. So um, really focused on infrastructure. And we found that the the um, nonpartisan uh, bill that was passed for infrastructure here in North America or in the United States is really going to have some big impacts on the way that we build and where the government is supporting um, those with funds. Um, and so we're looking to hopefully build very fulfilling futures. Um, and those colors are going to re represent a lot of natural materials that we use in building products. And the last uh, but not least is Chief Empathy Officer. And this is bringing more care back into what we do for our jobs, but also what we do for ourselves. So there's a little bit of an element here of, of wellness and well-being, our own personal mental health, our own personal physical health, um, but also looking beyond that and seeing how we can put more care into the daily things that we do, not just for ourselves, but also for our, our families, our local communities, the planet as a whole, and in our workplace. Um, and so there's a lot of talk about kind of the future of work, um, where we will work, how we will work, what will the buildings look like that we will work in. Um, and, and so bringing that care in is, is part of that. And one of the big um, uh, segments and in industries that we're talking a lot about empathy and care is across the healthcare industry. There's a lot of hospitals going up. There's a, a huge, huge need for senior living um, and, and long-term care facilities. 
um, and bringing that care and that empathy into the design of those buildings um, is also going to be really important. So the colors there will support that. All right. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide because I want to make sure we get to the colors that do go with each theme. So let's jump right in and start with our accountability centered technology. Talk to us a little bit about these colors. Bryn, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, ACT starts with um, a lot of really interesting trends that we've been tracking. So it starts out with focal, um, which is symbolizing what Kiki was talking about earlier, how neutrals are warming up, um, how, you know, the really cold colors that we typically associate with technology are evolving a bit. Um, and then we've got the symbiotic smoke and mirrors and fair trade, which are all mica colors. And those are an interesting trend that we've been tracking in itself because um, metal tones, as we want to mimic natural metal materials, have been going away from the very intense sparkle, um, kind of a brighter uh, intense sparkle uh, to a more satin finish. So all of these are a bit more satin. Um, and then as we evolve in technologies within our coil systems, um, fair trade is a mica, but it also has a texture in it. So it's really combining a tactile finish with a very visual um, element to it. And, and untethered is our uh, coil print technology, um, which we've uh, more recently been uh, playing with. And that one has a, a mica base with a print coat, an ink coat on top of it, where it really mimics black and steel. Um, so again, we're mimicking natural materials and trying to provide uh, that kind of natural feeling, but um, using the, the technologies that we have at hand. And revolution um, really is taking the blue trend that we see with tech and kind of re-envisioning it. So it's, it's you know, more of a, a color of, you know, responsibility. It's a very common um, color in logos for companies uh, and things like that. So it's, it's taking that really bright blue, mixing it kind of with the navy trend and coming up with something that's, uh, we haven't really seen recently as far as the blues go. Now you say a mica base, what does that mean? So a mica is, uh, you know, a kind of, it, it adds the sparkle to okay. uh, the finish. So mica and metallic are typically in the coil industry used synonymously. They are different materials, um, but it, it's basically adding the sparkle into the, the product. All right. Wow. Very good explanation. Thank you. Um, I don't know which one is my favorite. I'll have to look at the colors <laughs> a little bit longer. And we are going to, at the end here, we're going to give you guys the link um, so that you can download your own copy of the full report because it's very interesting. Um, all right. Talk a little bit about the boldness and of the ACT. And I mean, you, you, you touched on it, um, but just looking in the, at that blue roof right there in that image, that looks kind of like that revolution. Yeah, so we're, we're really talking about contrast when it comes to ACT um, and bold, high contrast colors, but different from what we've seen before. So going back to our Texas, Texas example, the White House with the black roof, we're not really talking about that kind of contrast anymore. It's really mixing high chroma, so that bright blue with a neutral or having uh, the, the material breakout be different than what you typically see when you envision contrast on a building uh, and having really um, dynamic and interesting forms with the visual tactility and the physical tactility, um, which adds that kind of interesting tech aspect into it because we can, we can see things on you know, our computers and things like that, but how do we have the tactile experience as well? So trying to focus on how that could come through forms that we're seeing in architecture. Yeah, and I'll add one little thing is that if you if you follow the link that we're going to post later and you go and download this, one of the things that we do that's really important in our forecasts, maybe different than some other color trends you've seen out there is that we make it applicable to the specific industry, right? So we're going to always show examples of how these colors can be used through photography. So, you know, highlighting revolution here, probably in that previous slide when you saw, oh, neutral, 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 whoa, <laughs> check yeah. out that blue. How am I ever gonna use that blue on, you know, uh, on uh, for roofing? 
here we want to you know show examples so that you can get the feel and the idea of how those could be applied out in the market. Yeah, that's a nice looking roof. It's very, very pretty building. And I see it's paired with a neutral on the side. Um, it looks really nice. All right, let's move on to building fulfilling futures. Yeah, so building fulfilling futures all started out with how uh, natural materials are uh, being utilized today. So when we're looking at different uh, terracottas and those tones have been pretty prevalent in the last few years, how is that evolving with the kind of rusted metal look that's also been happening in the building products industry. So what we're seeing here is that fortified, which we're seeing is the evolution of the terracotta trend. Again, adding that visual texture of the mica and also the tactile texture of the additive that we have that makes it kind of a sandy feeling um, coating. And then we've got the grounded, which comes from a trend we've been tracking for a long time revolving around sand and how the sand tones and the sand textures have been increasingly important in the industry globally. So this is one of those colors that, you know, has a great influence in the Middle East. Um, and we're seeing in uh, a lot of different industries as accent colors. Um, and placemaking, we've been looking at um, agricultural trends and how, uh, you know, we can enhance the tones that we typically see on, uh, you know, barns and farm equipment and things like that, how to freshen that up. And we've noticed that, you know, lightening the green into that placemaking color, not having it too yellow or too blue um, really makes a nice balanced kind of foundation for the agricultural uh, trends that we've been uh, tracking in the market because that's a huge focus for our customers. So making sure that we're, we're coming up with different um, ideas and options to inspire uh, a change in that market. That one's the, one of our most difficult to evolve uh, with our customers. Um, and Procure, again, we're mimicking a natural material that's actually a walnut print. Um, and it's, it's a very balanced, not too high contrast, really looks like real wood when you, when you hold the sample. It's pretty amazing what we uh, have been able to do with our partners on uh, printing those materials, but a really nice balanced, even uh, very classic walnut. Um, and facade, we, with the metal trends that we've been looking at a lot um, as architects, frequently ask for that most often. Uh, facade is that champagne color that we've been seeing, okay, silver is too cool, gold is too warm, we need something in the middle. So that champagne color uh, really comes into effect there. And it's, it's it, it, in my mind, this facade adds that champagne color with that concrete color. So it's a really great base foundational color. And then we have Vital, which is an evolution of navy blue. Navy blue has been a very popular color in building products, uh, increasing in popularity over the last five, seven years or so. Um, and this is the next evolution of that. This is adding a hint, hint of green, making it a little bit darker. We're, we're really seeing that um, kind of almost black turn into a navy almost black. So it's a really interesting color as we're looking at the dark blue trends and how those have evolved in the last few years and where green is gone and how they're kind of meeting in the middle together. Wow, great explanation. I'm just curious, do you guys get to come up with the names? We do, yes. <laughs> That's the fun part, right? Yes, yeah. <laughs> One of the fun parts, the whole thing is, is great. Um, excellent, so moving on to uh, Chief or, oh, okay, you are, sorry, we're still on here. <laughs> and we talked about, here's an example. This is the, um, what was the name of this? The placemaking? Placemaking, yes, yes. I think that looks fantastic. Yeah, so we're, we're just trying to improve, uh, you know, the, the individuality and how we're, you know, able to make our own marks on our projects and residential homes and all of those things. So making colors uh, more comfortable and attainable for our customers customers to digest because again sometimes the that blue in the first story is not their cup of tea and that's okay but we we want to push the boundaries and make people think about color differently as it comes to building products 
Excellent. So many choices. It's a good thing that you guys are there to help. <laughs> because, <laughs> so, you know, choosing color is, it, it, especially on, on metal roofs, um, like you said, you know, they last, they have a very long lifespan. So you really want to make sure that it is the right choice. Um, now we'll move on to chief empathy officer, which, you know, is interesting. I want to hear about these colors because um, you mentioned uh, you know, medical care, long-term care, senior living. So let's talk a little bit about um, these colors. Yeah, so when we start with awe, awe is, I mean, it's a bright color. It's uh, an, an attention grabber. And I think that this really stems from our need for empathy in our societies. So really putting that um, intention and uh, kind of a, a a shout for help in a, in a sense uh, is really interesting and in how we're we're seeing this used is in accents. Uh, we've got uh, hospitals that have used this on like under, uh, you know, under things of um, like different patios and things like that as accents to be very unexpected and different um, and to show that, you know, it's okay to change. It's okay to have color in your projects. It's okay uh, that we're, we're moving away from, you know, all solid great buildings. Um, and compassionate here, this one is, uh, again, harnessing off of that navy trend. This one is a, a truer navy, but it has a gray undertone, so it's a tad dustier uh, than the typical navies that we've been seeing in the past. So it's, again, we're, it's a very important trend, and we're still seeing it very active. It's just shifting slightly. And then we have care culture, which also comes off of that sandy neutral trend that we're uh, you know, seeing so heavily come into the market. It's, it's on the front end, but we're seeing it uh, come in pretty hot. So we're seeing these um, with the textures and with so many different options of customization. Uh, this one's a really great way to, you know, kind of change up that, you know, the, the different neutral options because it can be used as a base. And uh, we, we frequently put together um, colorways for our customers. So we can show you how to use care culture on your projects um, and where it would make the most sense. Cause that one I think is a little bit uncomfortable still for some people to adjust to. Yeah. And reflection is in almost black. So again, we're seeing the black trend kind of uh, lighten up a little bit and um, switch the, the perspective of it as, you know, we're seeing uh, kind of things soften up a little bit as far as um, the contrast levels and what people are really looking for maybe isn't that stark black roof. So uh, we're, we wanted to highlight that, you know, we are, we are considering um, where this is going and how we can better use the different um, abilities that we have to make in our labs. And then rediscovery is a pearly silver. It's got kind of a warmth to it. It's, it's pretty light. So it's, it's very satin and silver. It's very comforting for a, a, a mica based product. So this one I think would be, you know, really great as a silver roof, if that's what you're interested in. Um, and then esteem is a really solid um, gold, not too light, not too dark. We're not too orange. We're not too yellow. It's kind of a perfect in between um, that is, utilized in a lot of uh, monumental architecture that gold as you know a curtain wall option or um, as accents throughout throughout the project. Excellent so let's take a look at one of them in use and this is compassionate. Yes so this one uh, you know I I have talk to a couple customers that have thought that Navy is the most ridiculous building product they never heard of. So uh, we're, we're really trying to, again, show these in context situations to try and help people visualize what this really could be. So, you know, in the, the barn dominium space, Navy is very big. Um, and in, you know, those more agricultural spaces, Navy is, is, Kind of hitting the mark right now um, and will continue as we move forward moving away from those greens and reds that have been around for so long so showing these in different contexts of you know residential agricultural barn dominions um, you know higher end multifamily housing uh, things like that we want to make sure that we're achieving that you know um, desired look of the high end aesthetic with um, you know where the, where the market is moving Excellent. Now we are coming up to the top of the hour. So I want to, I do want to talk a little bit about technology, but we promised you the link to download the report. So Bryn, maybe you could just go ahead and drop that in the chat 
um, and um, then that way you can access it yourself. So to just touch on how does technology help you in, in making these effects in these colors? Yeah, new advancements in technology, in resin technology, in effect pigments. Um, so we work with a lot of the global suppliers of different types of micas and different types of aluminum flakes. Um, pigments, um, when you can, um, you know, get both organic and inorganic pigments that have more color stability, um, then they perform longer and the color lasts longer, you know, in the marketplace, um, doesn't fade as, as much, you know, all of these, uh, opportunities allow us to be able to create and develop new colors and new looks. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about how we are doing these cool prints, how we're able to get a look like wood grain printed on these metal sheets with you know, rotogravure printing, but technology is now leading us you know, into, is there an opportunity for digital printing? Could we print whatever we wanted? Um, and so those are kind of like the next um, elements that that technology factor brings in for us. Um, it, it brings in opportunities for better performance, better durability, um, easier application, more efficient um, in the manufacturing process, more efficient in the installation processes um, for the products. And then, um, you know, as, as we continue to see the technology advancing, you know, we'll be able to then open up uh, the opportunity to create new colors and new effects. Wow. And yeah, technology is a game changer um, in what, what, what we're able to do. And it's pretty impressive. Um, so our last um, slide here, let's just, you know, touch on the importance of product life cycles. We've mentioned this a couple of times, you know, you don't want to put a, a color that's only got a three-year uh, bell curve trend um, on a, a roof that's going to last, you know, 35, 40 years. Um, so how important is that? I think it's hugely important. I think we're we're really uh, focusing on you know how we're gonna you know look in the future about you know, the all of these different trends that we're tracking now and you know the the subtle shifts that they make have a big impact in the market. So you know making sure that we're you know being mindful of all of the different resources we have and compiling all of that research and data to um, have the the correct influence on the architectural, the residential, you know, all the different markets we serve. Now you do this report every year, every so many every years? Every other year, every other year. Every other year, okay. Yes. Cause yeah, I mean, we've got colors in here. And so it's gonna be really interesting in two years to see what things are changing and, and how colors are shifting and what's going on in, our world uh, as we know it and how that affects colors. So I'm really um, excited to that. Um, hopefully we can have you back in two years and uh, we can take another look at this. Um, but at this point, I'm going to open it up. If there are any questions, I will give the chat a quick check. We did put the link out there for you. Um, so feel free to download that and dive in and explore it um, at your leisure. And I just want to thank Bryn. I want to thank you and Kiki. Um, this was so interesting and so fascinating. And I just can't believe the amount of research and, and effort um, that you put into this to um, help us all be a little happier. I feel like, you know, it really affects so many parts of what we do. So thank you. And thank you to Sherwin-Williams. Yeah, thank you, Karen. I, I would like to just remind everybody one thing, um, color cells but the right colors sell better. So come to us for your color solutions. Okay, real quick question. How do you factor gloss or sheen trends into the color trends? Yeah, I'm gonna um, let Bryn take this one because she's been working really, really heavily on different finishes and textures. Yeah, so we uh, explore special effects as a whole uh, very in depth. Like it's, it's an insane study that we do pretty frequently of, you know, what's the, the best color shift? Is, is there a new need for color shift all the way into gloss and sheens? 
So, you know, we've seen low gloss uh, be the, the biggest ask from the market for a long time. We're seeing that shift a little bit back into that kind of 30 gloss sort of standard finish. Uh, people aren't dying to have the low gloss anymore because it can kind of come across as maybe a little bit chalky in some circumstances. So um, we're, we're definitely looking at gloss um, as a holistic trend. You know, what's happening in automotive? Are, is everybody wanting the high gloss car? Not necessarily. So uh, we're, we're taking those into consideration and all of our um, finishes that we have throughout the forecast do highlight a variety of, um, you know, glosses, textures, special effect pigments, uh, things like that to make sure we're highlighting all of our capability as it makes sense for our markets. Excellent, thank you for explaining that. Um, thank you everyone for attending today. Um, as I said, this is gonna be on demand on our website, usually within 24 hours. And we do these every month. So please join us next month, uh, July 26th, where we are gonna be visiting with Johns Manville. So thank you once again, everyone, and have a great day. Mm -hmm.